I wanted to actually start uh, with a challenge, a little puzzle. People are probably familiar with the tetrahedron and here's a square based pyramid. So the triangular faces are both the same on these shapes. A challenge for you, and we we'll perhaps solve it at the end of the video, is if I put these two shapes together, tell me how many faces there are on the shape that I would make by fusing two of the triangular faces together. Okay. Okay, there's your challenge. Um, you might think, oh, it doesn't sound terribly difficult for us. Number file. Um, so, but we'll, we'll look at that at the end. What I wanted to talk about in this video was an interesting thing I discovered working with a sculptor that lives nearby my house here. He's very famous, actually, Conrad Shawcross. And he loves using mathematical shapes in the sculptures that he makes. And one of the early challenges he faced, he realised that using a bit of mathematics uh, actually cut down the amount of work that he had to do as a sculptor. So he's been really obsessed with this shape, the tetrahedron. He sort of thought this was like one of the great building blocks of nature. And indeed, he's right. The ancient Greeks, of course, um, thought the platonic solids were the kind of atoms or, that made up the, the universe. So at that time, we thought earth, wind, fire and water were the atoms of the universe and each of those would have a shape. Earth, that was the shape of the cube. Water, the icosahedron made out of 20 equilateral triangles. Air was the octahedron made out of eight equilateral triangles. And fire was this shape here, the tetrahedron, the kind of spikiest of the shapes. Of course, we've got one platonic solid left over, which is the dodecahedron. And Plato left that to be the shape of the universe kind of interesting. Um, but Conrad Shawcross was, was interested as a sculptor in, yeah, well, what about taking this atomic shape, the tetrahedron, and, and seeing what you can build out of it? So one of his very first projects, he built 2,000 tetrahedrons and set himself the task of trying to see what he could build out of these tetrahedrons. And actually, he had a deadline, uh, and suddenly the deadline looms, and he's got to try and find how to put these 2000 tetrahedron together. But then he talked to a mathematician who said, well, you realize you don't actually have 2000 objects. You've got to find how to put them together. In fact, you have a much smaller number of building blocks because if you put two tetrahedron together, for example, there's really only one shape you can make out of that. There isn't another way I can put these tetrahedron together and get a different sort of shape. So already actually you've halved the problem and and this is the power of symmetry, you know, and that's my area of expertise, symmetry. Symmetry often is a clever way of cutting down a problem which at first sight seems like there are, you know, 2,000 different things you've got to put together. But then he realised, no, actually, you can halve that. There are only 1,000 objects that you need to consider. I've just got to put these together. Um, but the mathematician said, no, in fact, you can cut it down even more because if I have three tetrahedron, there's only one way I can put three tetrahedron together. So here are my little paper tetrahedron I made earlier for you. Here's our two put together. But actually, there's only one way I can attach a third object. And what I make is this kind of weird shape, almost little like a boat, isn't it? So you might say, OK, well, that's one way to put the tetrahedron together. But maybe I can fuse this on a different edge. And look, I've got something different. But of course, the point is that symmetry means that I can turn this. And I've always got that little boat structure. So it doesn't matter how many different ways I try. The symmetry means that I always get the same object. So uh, Conrad used this as a shortcut in a way, the symmetry of how you put these together. Say, I don't need to consider 2,000. I only need to consider a third of that and use this as my basic building block. And that's what he used to make some of his um, first interesting structures out of this tetrahedron. But if you go up to four, then it, then you do then you lose it. Four, you can start. Yeah, raising. then you start to um, have uh, different directions that you're coming at. And so this is really the basic building block for his sculptures is this particular one here. But then there are new decisions you've got to make. And what he found was there were interesting tendrils, quite unexpected shapes that emerged out of this. If you look at Conrad's work, you see just amazing kind of weird directions that he's been taken on by this particular object. And recently he's discovered a kind of new sort of shape, which I actually had not been aware of, because one of the interesting things is with platonic solids, which of them can you pack and fill space with? A cube, clearly you can uh, stack cubes and, and fill the whole of space. But do any of the other 
objects actually fill space. You can take a, a, a slightly non-symmetrical tetrahedron, squash it a bit um, and, and fill space with that. But with the actual symmetrical tetrahedron, if you try and fill space, it doesn't work. And there's always kind of a little bit left over. And Conrad's made this very interesting shape that looks like it's trying to be a, an icosahedron. It's sort of building up lots of triangles but they don't quite fit together and there's kind of an interesting gap. I think that's very interesting, an artist using these shapes to sort of discover a very asymmetrical shape made out of these tetrahedrons that looks like it's trying to be something symmetrical but doesn't quite work. It's kind of interesting, the sweet spot between something that is trying to be perfect but it isn't quite. Does that tetrahedral boat have a name? It really should do, doesn't it? I mean, but now you've challenged me with that, I, I don't know what that would be called. Um, perhaps people in the comments down below, either we can christen it, uh, give it a name, or maybe somebody does know a name for that. Perhaps it could be called the, the Shawcross shape or something. <laughs> it is boaty. It is a little bit boaty. So, so I think it's interesting how you can use symmetry very often to, to cut down the hard work you've got to do. And, and very often, in, when I'm looking at a particular mathematical problem, uh, sometimes you're looking at an equation um, and it can be solved in many different ways, uh, but spotting that actually all of the solutions are kind of symmetrical versions of each other is often a way of cutting down the work. You just have to find one solution and then use the symmetry to find all of the others. So that's a very uh, common trick in mathematics and in science, but it was intriguing. This is the first time I'd seen it used by a sculptor as a, you know, oh yeah, use the symmetry and cut down the work. What work was he cutting down, um, Professor? Was, it, was, it, was he having to cast less pieces or something like that? Or? Well, he'd actually made all of these 2000 um, uh, cubes out of wood, um, but what he'd cut down was just what he needed to put together was these three, and then they were the building blocks from which everything else, you know, there was nothing new that would emerge if he hadn't have done that. At first sight, you would think there may be many more possibilities, but the symmetry showed, no, all of these are actually examples of the same thing. So maybe we should come back to our little challenge because that was about putting shapes together and understanding uh, what shape emerges by putting two together. So uh, at first sight you may say, oh, this is pretty obvious. Um, this shape has five faces. This one has four faces. When I put these together, I lose two faces. So five plus four is nine. Uh, so I should get seven faces. What's the big uh, problem? But something rather curious happens because when I put these together I lose two more faces because look at this these two line up and so these two actually become one face so this object actually has five faces one two three four five faces so that's a little bit of a surprise that comes out of that I hope you perhaps experience that oh that's unexpected. Um, and what's curious about this is this was set in one of the SAT exams uh, in America, um, just to see how good you are at conceptual visualization. And they didn't realize that um, this kind of rather curious answer. So the, the people who said seven got the score and those who said five um, were given no marks at all. But actually it turns out rather curiously that when you put these together, um, this shape actually only has five faces. In this shape, you've got um, two faces on this side and two that faces on this side that, that fuse. So, so actually, we, this, which you might have first thought counted as uh, two different faces. You've got one, two, um, three, the square on the bottom, and the last triangle there, five. Totally got me. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, I, that... I would have got the mark in the SATs, though. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That was what was so crazy. See the links in the description for more videos with Marcus de Sortoy, plus links to his books and theatre productions, other things he's up to. So for example, you might want to know, um, well, is this particular statement provable from the axioms? <laughs>